So we live in a culture that says things like that. We, we live in a culture where gender is loosely defined as a social construct instead of how it has always been defined and used, the word gender, as a synonym for biological sex. Terms, we live in a culture where terms such as husband, wife, man, woman are seen by some, maybe many, as outdated, binary, and even hateful. The, term man and, the terms man and woman are often are being qualified by prefixes such as cis or trans. They're being replaced by phrases such as non-binary, agender, and intersex. People are creating their own semi-unique pronouns. I say semi-unique pronouns, right? It's like the kid who, um, you, you knew this kid in high school, right? Like, I just want to be different. I just want to be unique. And they dress like all their friends, right? No, they're not. You're, listen, you are unique, but not because of that, right? But people are creating their own semi-unique pronouns and listing their pronouns on their social media accounts. My personal perspective here, if their pronouns are listed, it's hard to actually believe anything else they say. It kind of just, all right, like, we love you, but this tells us something about your worldview that you think you have to list your pronouns. Right? Okay? And it doesn't tell us something good about your worldview. Pronouns, basic he, him, she, her, they, them. Pronouns such as v, ver, vis, vis, z, zem, zire, zires, zim, zem, like these are, this is not English. This is not English. We have biological men competing in women's sports. Men who were mostly comparatively terrible competing against other men are now winning national swimming championships. They're breaking the skulls of women with whom they are in fights. That happened. All in the name of equality. Doesn't sound like very good equity or equality for the women. Right? Biblical marriage is seen as patriarchal and outdated. People are identifying themselves sexually in various outlandish and destructive ways. Hetero, okay, well, homo, bi, lesbian, gay, trans, poly, queer. A semi-new version of this is, a, is, a, is an orientation labeled MAPS. M-A-P-S. Do you know what that is? This is an orientation that defines themselves as a minor attracted person. Meaning, it's not a, that I'm attracted to, to just men or just women or both or whatever, or any, anywhere on the spectrum, but I'm only attracted, this, a maps would say, not me, a map would say, to those who are minors. And you can't say that that's wrong because that's who I am. That would not fly well at the Dill House. This is the culture in which we live. We live in a confused, broken time in human history. We live in a confused, broken time in many Many who struggle in areas or think in ways like this previously are victims themselves, leading to further brokenness, leading to further difficulty, leading to further shame. And their response, because they don't know Jesus, they're trying to find their way out of this. And they are confused, therefore they are finding the wrong way that won't actually lead them out. It will lead them further in. But they don't know that. They don't believe that. And therefore, it, is, it becomes tied to their identity. And when we speak about behavior, it is, it is responded like, 
you're not talking about my behavior, you're talking about my identity. And we live in a culture that is very feelings first. We live in a culture that is very feelings first. And the word of God would say, I have an answer if you'll listen. I can give you peace that you're looking for. I can give you hope that you desire. I can give you joy that is lasting. The God of the Bible offers everything that is being searched for. So what will we do? And how did we get off track? Where, where did all this happen? What's right, what's right and wrong about sexuality, about marriage, about relationships? Should we compromise on these foundational truths about mankind? Well, today, what we are doing, we're going to go to the beginning. We're going to go to the beginning, and we will see on day six where God knows something important that he is going to reveal to Adam then to Eve, thereby to all of mankind. And if we will simply grab on to what God has for us, everything we are looking for can be fully found in Him. Are you, are you with me today? Are you with me today? So let's see what the Word of God says. Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. All right? So what we're going to see here, I'm going to give you the first three points quickly. Ready? I'm, I'm going to just say them right now. So if you're taking notes, I'm going to give them to you right now. This is going to be a big picture here, and then at the end we're going to zero in on some things where we see that we see about marriage, specifically in, in verse 24 and in verse 25. So here are your first three points. Ready? This is big picture over this passage. Point number one, God anticipated Adam's desire. God anticipated, oh, there went my notes. God anticipated Adam's desire. Number two, God abetted Adam's desire. We'll talk about what that means in a minute. God abetted Adam desire, Adam's desire. And number three, God attained Adam's desire. We are obviously alliterating during this portion today. There would be no more alliterating after this. Um, I couldn't make it work, and so I quit trying. All right? So number one, God anticipated Adam's desire. Look at verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a... I will make him a helper fit for him. So let's, let's dig into this just for a second. Mankind was created for relationship, created for relationship with God and created for relationship with people. We were created for relationship. Um, one of the things even um, as early as April of 2020, Dr. Phil came out. Now, we would certainly not agree with Dr. Phil on everything, but I think he was right about this. Dr. Phil came out as early as April of 2020 and said that the lockdowns involving school and just normal lockdowns would likely prove, and he believed would prove, to be more devastating than COVID itself. Why? Because we are created for relationship. We need others. We were created for relationship with God and with one another. Not only that, but in part that. See, man was created here. We don't have woman yet. God is not done creating. This is day six. This is part of day six. So he's right in saying something isn't good because it's not done yet. Okay? What was not good? It was not good for man to be alone. Listen, aloneness is a problem for all people. And ultimately, when God gives a spouse, a husband and wife to one another, that is God's cure for our aloneness problem. That is his ultimate cure for our aloneness problem. Now, it's right. God calls some people to live single lives, and the Apostle Paul was one of those, right? But we also find the Apostle Paul in relationship and doing ministry even with other people, right? And so we see here that God anticipated Adam's desire. Now, look at what it says in verse 18. It says, it is not good that the man should be alone. This is after, like, day, it was good. It was good. It was good. It was good. After this, we see God say it's very good when it's completely done because at that point, there's man and woman. We see in Genesis 1, 26, 27, that man and woman are created. Now we're coming back to chapter 2, and we're just zooming in on day 6. So this is the part of day 6 here, and it's not good that man should be alone. So it says here now, 
um, it says, uh, I will make him a helper fit for him. Now, ladies, that sounds patronizing a little bit, doesn't it? Like, a, here's your little helper. Let me, let me give you a little helper, okay? Can I just encourage you that that's not? God calls himself throughout Scripture, I am your helper, I am your help. I'm a very present help in time of trouble. God calls himself that. Jesus says, in the book of John, he says, I will send the, the Holy Spirit to you. The helper. The helper. This is not like a minimalist role here. This is important. And on top of all that, ladies, you know what it means? It means if you're married, your husband, he needs help. <laughs> right? You knew that already. But we're just highlighting that. Right? So this is not a minimalist role here. Okay? You need to know this ultimately here. Here, here's a take-home for everybody. Single, married, young, old, widowed, whatever. Whatever you need, that is a need. God knew it before you did. God knew what you needed before you knew what you needed. Hello? So this is great news. This is great news. Adam is not aware of this issue at this time. So first, we see God anticipate Adam's desire. Second, we see God abetted Adam's desire. In other words, God kind of fans the flame to some degree, so Adam will see that he is in need, that it's not good yet. Look at what it says, verse 18, and then we'll read verses um, 19 and 20. Then the Lord God said, it is not good and should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So but you would think, verse 19, so God put Adam to sleep, and that's not what happened first. What happened first? Look at verse 19. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. God had already created all the kinds. FYI. Already created all the kinds. All right? Let's keep going. So he brought them, brought them to the man to see what he would call them, and whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not a found a helper fit for him. Adam now sees. Oh, there's male and female. There's male and female. There's male and female. There's male and female. There's male. He's looking at these animals going, I don't think rhinoceros is going to work for me, God. All right, elephant is a No. Okay? Serpent? I don't think so. What? And now Adam is aware that there's male and female and all these other kinds, but not yet for him. And God helps him become aware of this. None of them could have been a help for him. It, listen, if macroevolution was true, some further evolved version of man would have had to procreate with some lesser evolved version of man to continue the evolution. We don't see that here. We don't see that here. We see there's all the animals, but there's one man and not yet a woman. So it's not yet good. Adam names them, and then we move forward. Again, the Bible does not allow for macroevolution. No compromise here. We compromise on food. We don't compromise here. No compromise. Let's keep looking. Number three, God attained Adam's desire. Let's look at verses 21 through 25. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is at last, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Both naked and not ashamed. So number three, so God attained Adam's desire. So we see here uh, a couple things. One, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. So, so God chose what portion of man's body, of Adam's body, to take and then to use to form Eve. We see 
Adam say she's called woman because she came out of man. That's kind of what the original word meant, right? Came out of man. So why did God choose a rib from his side? I was doing a wedding one time, and when I was talking about this in the vows, the bride, who is apparently an evolutionist, started laughing in the middle of the ceremony. Broke my heart. Those people are no longer married, by the way. When you have a lack of understanding of God's creation, of his role, of the definition of marriage, it's hard to have a healthy marriage. It's hard to have a healthy marriage when you do understand it. <laughs> right? Because there's two imperfect people in it now because of Genesis 3. Right? I love the idea that God didn't take part of Adam's head and create woman with it. So she would be over him. He also, though, gentlemen, did not take part of Adam's foot so that you could just stand on her. He took part of Adam's side. Where does woman stand in relation to man? Behind? In front of? Or, or beside? The Word of God would say beside. Would say beside. Beside. The word of God would say, beside. So we see here two sexes, two genders. They are fixed and they are binary. Literally, there's two. You can only be one or the other. There's not a spectrum. You might be a more masculine female than other females, but you are still a female. You are still a woman. You might be slightly more effeminate than another man. You might be less brutish, what, however you want to kind of define masculinity. Right? Still a guy. In this, I, I grew up with a guy. His name um, was Tyson. Um, Tyson had six fingers, not on his left hand, on his right hand. Okay? Some of you get the reference. Had six fingers on his right hand. Our, human, our fingers on the human hand, because there was, he was born with six, maybe some was, someone was born with none, are human fingers now considered to be on a spectrum? Or would it, are we still right to say humans have five fingers on each hand? And when we see that they don't, we understand that something's off. There's nothing morally wrong about that person, but something, something happened that wasn't, that wasn't good. Right? Fingers are not on a spectrum now. Gender is not on a spectrum. There's male, female, man, woman. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's not to belittle someone who is struggling with some form of dysmorphia or something like that. But it is wrong. In the same way it is wrong to tell someone who is struggling with anorexia that, no, 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 you actually are healthy. You're, you're, you're just fine. Or, no, 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 so the person who's, who's uh, extremely obese. In the same way it's wrong to tell either one of those people, no, you're healthy, you're fine, it doesn't matter what your doctor says. It is equally wrong to tell the person with some type of dysphoria, no, 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 the way you're thinking is good and right and all these other people are wrong and they're evil and they're hateful and they're bigoted. That is morally wrong to do that. So, male and female came from Adam's rib. Now, what we see here is that God provided. It wasn't good, God provided. What we have to make sure we don't attempt to do is to take a good desire, a desire that we are given by God that we should have, and then seek to fulfill that desire outside of God's design. Just because it might be a good, right desire doesn't mean we can fulfill that desire any old way we want. 
There are right and wrong ways to fulfill even good desires. And on top of that, sometimes the desires we have are not good. Just because you have a desire doesn't make it a good desire. Right? So we as the people of God must stand upon the Word of God. And then we see verses 24 and 25 that we're going to get to. Uh, Verse 23, this is interesting. Verse 23, first recorded words of, of mankind. What is it? A man singing to his wife. I love that. I love that. Wes, you should try that this afternoon. Go for it. All right? Maybe it's poetry, maybe it's song. Either way, it's pretty cool. All right? Those guys get all the girls. All right, so um, Jesus repeats verses 24 and 25 in the New Testament. Paul repeats them in the New Testament. We see them in Scripture elsewhere. So this is not a one-off. So Jesus is affirming verses 24 and 25, right? Okay, so here we go. Now, so we see kind of the big picture here. Let's look at what we can glean about marriage. Now, listen, if you are not married at this time, maybe you're widowed, you should be able to look at this and go, you know what, yep, and let me, listen, the older women are called to teach the younger women in part, one of the things that you're called to teach those that are younger than you, how to love your, their husbands. That's what Titus 2 talks about. That's one of the things that's listed, right? So if you are a widow, you still, this still applies to you and affects you, and you should be teaching the truth of God to those younger than you. If you are a, an older, a senior saint, and you are still married, and God still got both of you here, praise God for that. Then you're living this, and you should call, be called to be a living example of this. If you're middle-aged, same principle. But you're also, we are also looking to those older than us and going, man, I want to get there one day. Look how that is, right? This is where we're growing in this. If you are a young married person or an engaged person, you need to understand the truth of this and how to apply it to your life. If you are a single person, Regardless of age, if you are a single, any future relationship has to meet and be under this paradigm. You understand this. This is a big deal. We're dealing with family now, right? Are you with me? All right. So, some basic principles here. This may not be everything. I felt like these are the big rocks we, the Lord may have us focus on today, right? Here we go. Lessons for marriage. Number one. Marriage is designed and defined by God. Maybe I should have also included the word alone. It's implied. Marriage is designed and defined by God. Now, just FYI, ladies and gentlemen who are not yet married or maybe no longer married, let's let's understand where Adam was when Eve came along. Adam had a job, he's naming animals, and he's a gardener. Hello? Before Adam had a job, he had a relationship with God. Relationship with God, personal relationship with God, a job, and then he was ready for marriage. Not until then. Ladies, don't date boys. Just because they can grow facial hair does not make him a man. Hello? Why? Well, he's just a, he's a, he's a, but he's a boy. He's living in his mama's basement with her high, he's not even paying for her high-speed internet. He's, he's, he's mooching. He's on the, the black leather couch, and he's, play, he's really good at Call of Duty. Is that in your, like, wheelhouse, ladies? That's your filter? That's, what you, that's the guy you're looking for? Ladies, if he's not a man, let somebody else have him. Now, if you're already married, it's too late. <laughs> too late. Okay? But marriage is designed and defined by God. So let's get into some specifics about this. One, well, two technically. Marriage involves one man and one woman. Each of the only two existing genders. I say that again. Marriage involves one man and one woman. 
one of each of the only two existing genders. There are only two genders. They, again, they are fixed. They are binary. They do not change. There's not a spectrum. This means same-sex unions are anti-God and are definitionally not marriage. It's not marriage. You or I may live in a place that has some type of a same-sex civil union, which is still immoral. But it is not marriage. You must change the definition of the word marriage to make anything other than one man and one woman fit. Do you understand? It is definitionally in correct. It's not marriage. Stop using the term same-sex marriage. You might as well be talking about like Candyland somewhere. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Maybe a same-sex relationship, maybe a same-sex union, but it is not marriage. It is not marriage. So, Number one, number two, whatever. Marriage involves one man and one woman, one of each of the only two existing genders. We see that in Genesis 2. We see that throughout. Now, here, here's, here's the thing. Uh, the next point, marriage is a monogamous, lifelong relationship. Next point, marriage is a monogamous, lifelong relationship, meaning one man, one woman, till death do us part. There is no poly anything here. Here's what's interesting. We see men married to multiple women in Scripture, but we never see it affirmed by God. Never. We never see God going, no, that's good. You should marry that second or third or fourth or fifth wife, too. You want to get, listen, we're going to, in, in February, which Valentine's Day is in February, we're going to start on Sunday mornings, we're going we're gonna to begin a Song of Solomon series in February. It's going to be all sorts of fun. For me, Julie will be under the chairs multiple times throughout this event. Worship Together Weekends, we will call Zach Morris Time Out during, for this series, and we will go back to Matthew for those weeks. Because, just, there's a, in the, even in, in Jewish culture, you had to be through Bar or Bat Mitzvah before you could read that book, right? So, so when, when the littles are up here and there's not an option for them to be elsewhere, We'll call time out. We'll go to a different, on the last weekend of every month, that's Worship Together weekend, right? We'll call time out. We'll go to a different passage. When they go back downstairs the next week, we're right back where we were. All right? Okay? Just so you know. All right? Just so you know. But you want to get Julie going? Get her talking about how, how Solomon gets to be the one to write that book with all his wives and all his concubines, right? It doesn't mean what he says is incorrect, but his application of it, we see as he goes throughout life, is very incorrect. Hello? Okay? So, marriage is a monogamous, lifelong relationship. One man, one woman. Listen, in our culture, polygamy will be accepted next. That's what's coming next. Well, I mean... They start one man, one woman. Well, how come man and woman? Why can't it be man, man? Why can't it be woman, woman? Why can't it be people who see themselves differently than just man or woman? The next step is, well, how come just one? How come just one? Okay, I love you, right? I love you. Shoot me in the head before I do something like that. She would. Right? One man, one woman for life. For life. Till death do us part. Till death do us part. Next. Marriage initiates a new family. Look what it says here in verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, we're going to get there in a second, and, and hold fast to his wife. Listen, when your child got married you did not gain a son or a daughter. Well, we've got these three sons. Hallie's not getting married. 
Jesus is coming back first. I'm just like, that's as close to prosperity gospel as I can get because I want to claim that one. I'm going to name and claim, right? <laughs> Daddy's heart, okay? The boys can do what they want <laughs> within the bounds of Scripture. That's, that's just me, okay? Um, when Eli gets married, it is not right for us to say we're gaining a daughter. No, we're not. No, we're not. My son is starting a new extension of our family. And it's a new family. The I'm gaining a son, I'm gaining a daughter junk, and I mean that word, it is junk. You know why we think that way? Because we're insecure and we're fearful and we want to keep, like, keep our little mess. When the truth is, we should be launching these people out. The Bible says that children are like arrows in the quiver of a righteous man. What do you do with arrows? You shoot them at the enemy. Not that the in-laws are the enemy. <laughs> but you launch those suckers out. You don't take the arrow and go, come here, little chicks, come on, stay in here. And if they leave, you shoot them. This is how so many families in America like, are now. You're not bringing them into your family. They're an extension of your family, but that's their new family. Which means, in-laws, I'll say this in Spanish so it doesn't uh, offend as many people. Sierra la boca. You know what that means? No. Close your mouth. <laughs> Not your family. Their family. Don't you think God can talk to them? We'll get into more of that in a second. But it initiates a new family. Praise God for the extension. Praise God for the grandkids, Lord willing, that'll come. Praise God for that. The only reason we had kids is for grandkids. Right? Because that's when the fun starts. Until then, it's work. Right? Hello? Next. Marriage is a covenant. It's a covenant. Marriage is a covenant. It is a lifelong monogamous covenant between one man and one woman. The word covenant is extremely important. Our Bibles are broken into Old and New Covenant, Old and New Testament. That's what that means. Okay? Okay? covenant. It's a promise, but it's bigger than a promise. A covenant is not a covenant until it is ratified in blood. Y'all, okay, if you have littles in here, earmuff time. Seriously. We'll get into the consummation part here in a minute. Hear me, except for the littles. Marriage is to be consummated. It's a blank that's coming in a minute. But at the initial consummation, why in the world would there be blood involved? Okay, we can stop with the earmuffs. Because God designed it from the beginning as a covenant. A covenant must be ratified in blood. Marriage is a covenant. This is why we save ourselves for marriage. And God's full of grace. He's full of mercy. He can forgive anything. But that's why it was designed that way. And great, in, in, in my, my perspective, in, in fullness, that is why it's designed that way. Why would that part of the body for a lady be there? Why would God make it that way? I know it just got weird. Y'all wait for Song of Solomon. It doesn't bother me at, this doesn't bother me at all. I used to talk to 15-year-olds about this stuff. You're easy. <laughs> Marriage is a covenant. The root word of covenant means to cut. It involves blood. Marriage is a covenant. And the two have become one. They have cleaved together. Listen, if something is cleaved together, it takes a cleaver to separate. You know what a cleaver is? It's a big knife. Because they're one. They're one. More on that in a second. Next. Marriage includes man's passionate pursuit of his wife. Marriage includes man's passionate pursuit of his wife. 
not the wife's passionate pursuit of her husband. Let's go ahead and shoot that bird right now. Ready? Okay. Gentlemen, if you are single and a girl is chasing you, the answer is no. Ladies, some of you, well, then what do I do? Like, I'm trying, like, he, he won't, then he's not a man. Why do you want to marry a boy? Here's what you do. Like, drop some clues. Help him. Help him. Like, we're, we're struggling at this. We get it. We get how hard it is for you now as married men, some of us. Right? So drop us some clues. Make it easy for us if you're interested. Like, help us there if you can. But you don't chase boys. Period. You let the man pursue you. Otherwise, gentlemen, if you are so passive that, like, I'm afraid of failure, you only have to get it right once. You don't need to marry every, you just marry one. And you know what happens when you fall on your face a few times, guys, because you asked and she said no? It makes you a little tougher, it makes you a little stronger, and also it makes you a little pickier. And that's not bad. That's not bad. So it says a man shall leave his father and mother, not a boy, because boys don't leave, boys live in the basement. A man should be standing on his own two feet because he has launched. Even if part of that launching includes where the stage he is, like I'm still living at home, but I'm going to school, or I'm going my, to my training, I'm doing these things so that I can launch. That's okay. But if he's 27 and he's never had his own address, this is not healthy. Moms and dads, love your son enough to say, you know what? If you stay here, okay, but you're, you're paying rent. You're paying rent because this is, you're, you're past the point of launching now. Right? Like you, not raising a boy, raising a man. Right? Again, Hallie can live at our house forever. I think there's a biblical principle even for that if, if the Lord leads that way. wish she was listening to this. But the man takes initiative. The man gets on his own feet with God's help. When dating, a good man will want to be around your friends and your family, ladies. If you are dating someone who isolates you from your friends and your family... They are doing it for a reason, and it is a bad thing. You listen? They're isolating you so that they can treat you however they want with no consequence. That's what's happening. And by the way, this is also one reason we really need involved dads. Really need involved dads. Parents, let your kids grow up. Train them, equip them. When they're little, you control, because they'll kill themselves if you don't. Right? I'm serious. I'm literally. Literally. Okay? But if they're 17 and you're still treating them like they're four, come here, let me make your lunch. Let me do it. Mama, know that. What are you doing? What are you raising? Teach him to be a man. So you, you, our parenting has to move from helicopter, coddle, you shouldn't helicopter, period, anyway, and let's not free range the other side either. Like, whatever they want to do is fine. That's dumb, too. We don't have time to get into that right now. But, if we control because we are afraid, we will raise anxious children. And what we as parents can even do, sometimes I've seen parents manipulate with their finances, I've seen parents manipulate with their emotions, I'll pay for school as long as you go here and you study this and you only do this. Because that's what I want. That's manipulation. That's not raising a man. That's you controlling. Listen, you'll have one of three relationships with your kids that are grown. Good, bad, or absent. You'll have a good relationship, a bad relationship, or no relationship. Those are your options, parents. What do you want? In order to help a good relationship, 
You can't control your grown children like you did when they were little. They will, they will either become the wiltiest boys and girls you've ever met, or they'll want nothing to do with you. At some point, you've got to get to where you're advising. And even as they grow, listen, they need to fall while they still live in your house and there's a net to catch them. If you wait till they're 18 and they move off to school or whatever is coming next for them and you just go, okay, all these things we were saying no to, now here's all of it, good luck. Stupid. Dumb. You need to incrementally teach them about choice, about consequence, about what will happen, and you need to advise. And let me tell you this. As they get older, until they are married, you need to advise when given opportunity. When they get married... You need to advise when advice is requested. And please stop advising when it isn't requested. You can ask for permission. Hey, I, I, I see something about this. If you want, I could talk to you about it. If you don't want to, it's okay. But I think I see something, and if you're interested, I, I'll, I'll tell you what I see. And then you can do what you want with it. Now listen, my oldest is 15. I'm not there yet. And I don't understand fully how hard that's going to be. I, don't, I want you to understand that. But I'm not so old that I don't remember how my dad handled things. I, I, know, I see how Julie's dad currently handles things. I, because he has handled things like that, Julie's dad and my dad in the past before he passed away, I have an open door to go ask her dad stuff because I know I'm not going to get shot down. I'm not going to get slapped with his words. I understand that there is an open door and there is wisdom there. And I can take it or leave it. I might see things differently. But he has developed relationship with me so that that communication is open. When, when someone goes into the ER and there is something dire, the first thing that happens is they put an IV in, or one of the first things that happens when they get there, they put an IV in, but all they put in it is saline. Why? Because the vein needs to be open and ready so that when they know what does need to be given, it's ready to go. Parents, keep the vein open, but stop trying to give medication when you don't know what they need yet. Right? Right? So we have to be wise and careful how we do this so that we set their marriage and their relationship and their future up for as much success as we possibly can. It's their choice, but at a certain point, we've got to stop being control freaks and trust God with our kids. Well, what if this happens? God's big enough to handle that. Well, what if that happens? God's big enough to handle that. This is not just about your marriage, it's about the future marriages in your family. And the extension of that family. What do you want them to be like? I could be here all day, i got to finish. We see parents sometimes manipulate with money. I'll pay for this if you'll do it this way. With their emotion. Well, we can't get mom angry. She'll, if she's mad, everybody's going to pay for it. So we gotta, we got to just do what she says and walk on eggshells and the pink elephant sitting over there, but just don't, pretend you don't see it. That's manipulation. It's not parenting. That's not wise. That leads to bad relationship or no relationship. That's what it leads to. What do you want? Some of you as parents need to leave here today and before you do anything else, you need to call your son and daughter and say, you know what? I'm sorry. Even if I think my perspective was right on this, I didn't handle it right. And I would like to ask you to forgive me. In my mind, I feel like you should always just be two, but you're not anymore. And that's hard for me, and I would like you, 
I would like to apologize. I want to ask you to forgive me. Some of you need to make that call today. Why? Because marriage includes man's passionate pursuit of his wife, not parents' control of the future family. And FYI, while I'm on it, ready? You might not get to do holidays the same way you always did. And that's hard. It's hard on this side of it, too. We, we want to be there, but we can't be everywhere. Please stop letting your feelings get hurt and make us feel guilty when we know we can't change anything. Right? All right. Next, the fun one. Marriage involves consummation. Quickly, because February's coming. I mean, not like till I finish, but um, Sol- Song of Solomon calls the wife's body the husband's garden. Do you know that? She says in Song of Solomon, enter into your garden. It's yours. The New Testament, in the book of 1 Corinthians, it talks about that the man's, the husband's body belongs to his wife, and the wife's body belongs to her husband. So no withholding. No using that as a manipulator. Well, okay, but if you want this, you do that. That's not biblical. That's sinful. Physical intimacy is not the goal of marriage, but it is an important aspect and expression of marriage. It should be an important part of your relationship so long as you are physically able. Ladies, serve him. Husbands, serve her. Last. This is so good. Marriage is relationally rooted in purity and integrity. Marriage is relationally rooted, not just rooted, it's rooted in Christ, but it's relationally rooted in purity and integrity. Look at the last part of verse 25. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Let's let's be fast here. Fully knowing and fully known. Not even a pocket to put his hands in. You know what that physically, it's, it's literal. This is literal, but it has more than just literal implications. It means no hiding. No secret. It means full trust. It means full purity. We try to know in various ways. Julie was talking to me about this last night. We try to know and to fill our our God-given desire for knowing and being known. We try to fulfill that, and sometimes in crazy places. This is why some of us are so addicted to social media, because we want to know. And we're posting so much because we want to be known. And social media is neutral. It's how we use it can be wonky, but it's, it's morally neutral, right? But the heart's desire to be known and to know can be expressed in, in ways that actually don't lead us into being known or knowing. But we think they might. And before long, what happens is we go that way thinking it'll fulfill, and then it doesn't, and then it leads us into worse and deeper brokenness. We try to do this sometimes with social media. Sometimes we binge watch that TV show because we just love those characters. We feel like we know them. They aren't real. A group of people sat in a room and typed words into a document, and these people are saying those words. They're not real people. Nothing I'm not saying that's in and of itself sin, but you need to understand why are you desiring to do that? Well, because you want to know and be known, but it won't solve the problem. Physical activity outside of marriage is a, it's a, it's attempting to desire this need to know and be known, but it'll lead you into further brokenness. 
doesn't solve the problem. So God says, well, how about I just give you your husband or I just give you your wife? How about I just do that? And then you fully know and be fully known. This is good. This is God's design. It says at the end, unashamed. When we are not attempting to find our knowing and being known outside of the marriage covenant, when we are doing it inside the marriage covenant, or before we're married, or maybe after we're divorced, but we're doing it in biblical God-honoring ways, that don't cross lines that are not supposed to be crossed if we're, if we're not married, we don't have shame. There's joy. There's peace. And there's not shame. Adam and Eve were both naked and were not ashamed. I want you to hear me. This is the goal of your marriage. Just FYI here. What we see right before this, verse 23, where Adam's doing the poetry thing, those are basically his marriage vows. Those are his marriage vows. What we as a culture sometimes do is we value the wedding over the marriage. We'll spend a year thinking about, let me back up, hold on. We'll spend from the moment a young lady can think about what marriage might be be thinking about the wedding and just finding some guy to insert into his spot. Wear this suit. Stand there. Say this. I got everything else planned. (laughs) Right? And ladies, that's awesome that you like that, that you care about that. A wedding is a great thing. I would rather your wedding be trash and your marriage be amazing then your wedding be amazing and elaborate and your wedding be like, uh, and your marriage be, uh, right? You had to pick? I mean, if we're going to pick, let's do both. But let's not, pers- if we have to pick one, let's prioritize the marriage over the wedding itself. Another little sidebar here. Ladies, you're thinking about the dress. Dress is important. What did Eve wear at her wedding? We didn't think about this. Look, she's, mad, like, she's doing it right now. This is a preview for Song of Solomon. All right? So apparently it's not about the attire as much as it is what it is. Can we just put things in perspective a little bit here? You want to spend 25 Gs on your wedding? Okay. I'd rather you, if you had to, invest that into a marriage. Invest that level of commitment into a marriage. Invest that level of understanding and time and effort into a marriage. Sometimes, and this is how we'll close, ready? Finally. Um, Sometimes we struggle with this, um, the idea of a trinity, right? We want to have these um, illustrations about water, vapor, ice, right? We want to talk about an egg illustration. All of these make you essentially a heretic, by the way. Don't use them. They're bad. Maybe you know what the best illustration for the Trinity is? Husband and wife who are one under God. Three and one. And in Ephesians 5, it even talks about, here's the mystery that no one knew until Jesus. The husband represents Christ and how he served and loved the church. And husbands, you love your wife like that. And wives, you represent the church, how you respond to and follow the activity and the leadership of the Lord. Husbands are not the Lord the same way, but that's the illustration. And here's what you need to understand. You were created for relationship, but ultimately your first relationship is your relationship with God. And that can only come from a personal relationship with Jesus. If you've never trusted him, trust him today. If you are married, implement this. If you are no longer married, teach others this. If you have been married, teach others this. If you are not 
yet married. Function like this. Some of us parents need to come today and we need to kneel and we need to pray. Because we have not been, none of us have been perfect, but some of us, we are in this pattern of handling things wrong, things wrong with our kids. And it's no wonder they've responded the way they have. And it might not be all you, but you need to own your part. Confess it to the Lord. And then try to make it right with them. Some of us today, we need to come and we need to pray. We need to bring our spouse right here and we need to pray for our marriage. Some of us today, we're not married, but we have a desire to be at some point, either again in the future or for the first time in the future. And maybe today we need to come and we need to say, God, I want to honor you with how I do all of this. And I don't want to follow the culture's definitions of, of what it says. I want to follow what your word says. So Lord, help me. And until the time that you let me find her, you let him find me, God, make, help me make my relationship with you the priority. And even after that, help my relationship with you be the priority so that that will go well. How's the Lord calling you to respond today? What will you do with what he says? Listen, marriage is awesome. It's hard, but it's awesome. The second best decision I ever made in my life was marrying Julie. The first best decision was trusting Jesus. Have a relationship with Christ. If you're married, have a right relationship with your spouse. Trust and follow the Lord.